1967. A landmark year for all things mysterious. A small town in West Virginia is plagued by reports of a flying, humanoid creature with red glowing eyes. A pair of hunters in California capture what many consider to be the best evidence for the existence of Sasquatch. Something else may have happened in 1967. Something that had the potential to rock zoology to its core. This body of a humanoid creature was touted around Midwestern America in late 1967 through 1970. Frozen in a block of ice, the being was said to bear an uncanny resemblance to a man, but with distinct non-human features, like a hair-covered form, large hands, and a misshapen face. An anonymous witness offered Crash Course Cryptozoology his account of seeing the creature on display when he was a young boy. Having seen advertisements touting a missing link, the witness stepped into a trailer booth and paid 50 cents to see the Iceman. He was instantly convinced by the creature's authentic, very real face. The Iceman was not particularly enormous in size, but was well built, with arms the witness was sure could climb trees, and legs that would be good for climbing mountains. The creature seemed to have no narrowing waistline, short, round toes, and various injuries. The witness claims the beast was so human-like that had it been dressed conservatively enough, it could walk around in public without being noticed. This witness is not the only one to have seen the Iceman. According to the account, Frank Hansen, who owned the body, charged only three cents for entry to any scientists willing to examine it. Bernard Huvelmans was a French zoologist and cryptozoologist who was often considered the father of the latter field. In 1968, Huvelmans and his colleague Ivan Sanderson traveled to the exhibitor's home to examine the carcass. We were looking at some sort of man. Not Homo sapiens, but some sort of strangely hairy man. Huvelmans and Sanderson were, too, convinced of the creature's authenticity. Following the examination, the two would go on to write papers on the subject. In his own paper, Huvaman claimed Hansen had said the Iceman was found in Hong Kong. If the specimen did, in fact, come from China, why is it then that the name Minnesota Iceman has stuck with it all these years? The answer is unclear. It is generally known that Hansen changed the origin story of the Iceman on multiple occasions, with the Minnesota claim being only the most recent. Hansen had claimed the Iceman was found in a storage unit in China, that it was found in a Siberian tundra, and that it was shot by an anonymous millionaire in the state of Minnesota. Although the story would stay strictly in Minnesota, Hansen would even go on to claim it was he who had shot the Iceman. In a 1970 edition of Saga magazine, Hansen described his encounter with the Iceman, which he claimed took place in 1960, while he was an Air Force captain spending time in Whiteface Reservoir. In the middle of a small clearing, there were three creatures. I felt as if my body had turned to stone. Without warning, the male leaped straight into the air from its crouched position. Screeching and screaming, he charged toward me. I cannot remember aiming my rifle, nor do I recall pulling the trigger, but a bullet must have slammed into the beast's body. As blood spurted from his face, the huge creature staggered, seemingly stunned by this unexpected happening. In many sweat-drenched nightmares, however, I have vividly envisioned the blood-covered face lying on the ground. I have absolutely no recollection of seeing the other two creatures ever again. His changing narratives were not perceived well by many researchers. Huvelmans, though, believed there was a good reason for the true story to stay hidden. A reason that, if true, might prove to be a violation of national law. We were struck by many things. The enormous hands and the enormous feet. And also, more especially, the features of the face. Because it was absolutely 
unlike any man on earth. It was uh, obvious that uh, this uh, creature had been uh, killed because the one eye was completely missing and the other was hanging out of the socket and it had blood all around so we thought it was probably shot in one eye and the bullet made the other eye pop out. There is no question that the Iceman could be a hoax, a uh, faked dummy, rubber dummy or what have you, as they, they told in the press, when you have seen something. We examined this creature for three days very carefully and we were very suspicious, I can tell you, at the start. But after a while that was quite ruled out. No, there is absolutely no doubt for me that I have been examining a Neanderthal man, a surviving Neanderthal man. Uvamans believed the specimen to be a kind of human, rather than a non-human primate. But for most, the Iceman generally matches the image of a Bigfoot, or a Sasquatch. The question is stark. Why would Huvamans, well versed in the subject of mystery, man-like primates, be so adamant the Iceman was not a Bigfoot, but a human? John Bindernagel, a late wildlife biologist, dedicated his life to studying eyewitness accounts of the North American Sasquatch. It might be said that Bindernagel knew the features of the alleged animal better than most. What they see, and sometimes describe for us, and sometimes draw for us, is a huge, hair-covered, upright, human-shaped mammal. <clears throat> This, this, of course, is very problematic because it is so human-like in its general appearance. But we should be aware that there are some anatomical details which are distinctly unhuman-like. We do see the broad shoulders, but note also the long arms and that short, thick neck, and in this case, a tendency towards a, a somewhat pointed head. Although the two are similar, Many witnesses, including Huvelmans, suggest the differences were enough to separate the Iceman and any kind of Sasquatch. In his scientific paper, Huvelmans elaborated, It is also possible that the radiographic, or later osteological, examination of this specimen reveals its total identity with the Neanderthal type. The conclusion published in Huvelmans' paper was, at the time, based on the contemporary knowledge of Neanderthal anatomy. From their discovery in the late 19th century through the 1970s and 80s, Neanderthals were thought to be a savage ancestor, with animalistic temperaments and bodies covered with varying degrees of hair. An image, Huomans claimed, was not at all unlike the Minnesota Iceman. This notion has been met with continuous challenge, so much so that it has been dropped. Archaeological evidence has since proven Neanderthals were intelligent and more human-like than initially thought. This tool, found at a dig site in 2013, was used by early Neanderthals to cut and shape leather. It is far from the only find of its kind, and its nature shows that Neanderthals did not grow hair or fur, but rather needed to skin animals for warm clothing. Although some media still posits their cold climate required natural hair covering, the evidence suggests that Neanderthals resembled us more than the Iceman. Huvelmans would go on to determine that the Iceman was not a true Neanderthal specimen, and was rather a new species he referred to as Homo pungoides, or ape-like man. If the eyewitness accounts are to be believed, and the Iceman was not only real, but a kind of human, it would have spelled moral and legal problems with the manner in which this specimen died. Rumors abound that the killing of the Minnesota Iceman would be counted as murder, and, for a short time, the body vanished. When Hansen put the Iceman back on display, it was clear to many that this body was not the original, but a fake, made of latex. Hansen would be open about this second corpse being a hoax, but stuck to his claim that the original was real. He claimed he would publicly release the original again, if he could be granted legal amnesty on national and state levels for any laws the obtaining of the specimen might have broken. His terms were never met, and the original never resurfaced. 
Subsequent analysis of the case by the late primatologist John Napier suggested Hansen had faked the whole case and that the original was the same latex hoax discreetly made by a company in the western United States. His analysis satisfied the Smithsonian Institute, and the case is considered laid to rest. Despite the consensus that the Iceman was a hoax, there are those who continue to say it was a real creature. You can see the broken forearm, fingernails. And I remember looking at this and there's people, you know, talking, and my dad too. Oh, that's a fake thing or something like that. And I said, <laughs> look at this thing. I don't know. I said, no, that's, I don't know what it is, but it's not, that's not a rubber doll. J.H. Lawson is a Missouri native who claims to have seen the original Iceman when he was a child and believes it was real. His narrative has starting similarities to previous accounts, including robust teeth, specific injuries, and a human appearance. And there was a, um, an exhibit, there was a, like a trailer type of thing inside there. Um, because you could take stuff in this mall. That's, a, that's why it was kind of a fun thing to do, go to the mall. There was always something. There was a car exhibit. Or there was Old West stuff. I remember Stagecoach being in there. And, but I remember being in that enclosure or trailery thing or whatever it was, you know, or canopy type of thing in the mall. And the guy that was doing it, that had to be Hanson. I don't know who else that could have been. So I was, I was absolutely enthralled by this thing i mean i got up there and he let us get right up on it i mean there was kind of like a little rail type of thing real close to that glass topped uh caskety type of thing and i was scooching up on it and my dad didn't go up in there and said, you know now don't do that and then this handsome guy says it's fine he's interested you know? and uh, after a while he went and got handsome got a box for me to stand on kind of he was kind of digging the fact that i was enjoying this thing and, and was and was seriously getting my face up on it to, to look i wasn't just walking by and making a you know a laugh or something like that you know it wasn't it wasn't perfectly clear ice there was um uh you know little bubbles and opacity and stuff like that and so the thing i remember most are hands and face you could see his teeth you could see blood you know that had leaked into the water you know, like to clean a squirrel or something like that in the pot, you know, up from the eye, the eye socket. You can see the broken forearm. Relatively human-like, and then when I read that book, they mentioned that, that they thought the thumb was much thinner and longer than a human thumb. I don't, I don't recall that. That's from the book. I mean, it'd be easy enough for me to say, oh, yeah, 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 the thumb. I'm just telling you what I personally recall. Reading the book from the descriptions from Sanderson and Hubelman's, they thought the thumb was unusual in that it, it in its proportion. Well, you could tell, you could kind of see portions of the feet. You know, if you got up on it, you you could see down in there a little bit. But they, you could tell the width. The width was. I mean, there there are no shoes that would fit that foot. You know, those those feet were two three times the width of a human foot. The hair was very natural. Like you see a real hairy guy, you know, at the beach, how it kind of lay down the middle of your, above your navel and stuff. It was very, it was, if that was a hoax, that was pretty masterful. And I think the chest was, you know, we're kind of flatter and wider, humans are. This thing was a bit more barrel chested. I don't know why you would need hands or feet that big. If you were gonna make a fake, why would you do that? Wouldn't it, wouldn't, your inclination be to have it be a believable proportion and these were, were I don't mean they're stupidly big like three foot long or anything like that but they were very large but it didn't really look like a juvenile like a like a young person but then you know if those things are real whatever that is I don't think that was a Sasquatch I don't know what the hell that thing was how would how I mean you'd have to see hundreds of them to figure out to get a sense of what they look like as they age so maybe that was not a real maybe that was not fully mature In 2013, a sideshow museum in Austin, Texas, acquired what was said to be the original Iceman corpse. Todd Disatel, an evolutionary biologist who has appeared on several cryptozoology programs, such as Monster Quest, Naked Science, and Is It Real, briefly examined the specimen in 2014. 
Dissotel described the corpse as synthetic, and that the covering of the specimen seemed to be fake wig hair. It is likely the Minnesota Iceman case will never truly be solved. For now, a replica sits in the Museum of the Weird in Austin, Texas. I realized was when I saw this, I was actually probably one of the last people to get to lay eyes on the Iceman because shortly after I got to see it, um, Frank Hansen, the man who owned it and was taking it around the country, decided he wasn't going to tour with it anymore. He stopped. He just disappeared basically with the Iceman. Nobody's known what happened to it for the last thirty something, thirty five years or so. And my biggest fear was that you know. Um, if it would, it would get lost again to some private collector or someone's private collection, we'd never see mine again. Despite this replica's place in the Museum of the Weird, as well as in the local culture of the area, its presence does not explain the disappearance of the first Iceman. The identity of this body, its location, and whether it even still exists remains unknown. Whether it is ever rediscovered, or is lost to history forever. The Minnesota Iceman will always remain locked within the realm of nostalgia of unexplained experiences.